Um, she is the founder of Hope for the Heart, um, which is a worldwide biblical counseling ministry. Um, I have heard her radio program in the evenings. I enjoy listening to that. And um, she, is, she is just an amazing woman. I've got to, uh, had the privilege of getting to know her, like I say, over the last um, several months. And just talking with her on the phone and even talking with her here at the conference has been a huge blessing to me and just a big encouragement uh, for what we're doing and um, knowing that these issues are really, really important that we're talking about. And um, so I know that you are going to be just wowed by her presentation. So it's my privilege to introduce June Hunt. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sweetie. Imagine being Marilyn. Marilyn, a straight-A student, a swim champ, the kind of all-American girl next door. Everybody liked Marilyn because she was just friendly, personable. And she had these friends at college who, who suggested that um, she be a part of a Miss America pageant. Well, actually, she had to first become Miss Colorado, but, you know, she, she said, I just prayed I wouldn't fall off the runway. And she did get the uh, acclaimed position of winner of Miss Colorado. And then here she is in this um, Miss America pageant. There was huge competition. She just didn't want to embarrass herself or her family. And then came the, run, the runway. She made the runway fine, and then she was walking the runway to lyrics. Here she is, Miss America. There she is. Your ideal. And everyone looked at her and thought, she is ideal. She's a gifted musician. She has this all-around ability. So admired. And what was so apparent was she knew that she had a sense of confidence, I mean, there was self-confidence, and not for the wrong reason. She was indeed um, influencing others. In fact, she did this whirlwind tour, which is normal for a Miss America, and afterwards she got an advanced degree, uh, Phi Beta Kappa, well-deserved. She's hired and by a huge corporation, uh, became the number one speaker, woman speaker at the time, and uh, did 23 television specials, hosted them. Decades later, later, decades later, she came before a different kind of podium with a different kind of message. She said, from the age of five to 18, my father violated me. It was unimaginable as people knew her because every single year she would be on the Miss America pageant telecast. And truly, she said, tonight I break my silence. These are her words. It means speaking the unspeakable word. From the time I was five until I was 18, my father sexually violated me. Now, how really could that be? Her father, a millionaire philanthropist, contributor to the Boy Scouts, the symphony, all these wonderful causes. 
He was mayor of Denver, Colorado. He certainly appeared to be a virtuous father to his four daughters, but he was a villainous perpetrator instead. In fact, as Marilyn attests, he believed he owned his wife and owned his four daughters. He felt he could do anything to them, literally anything. He was demanding and demeaning. I often think what goes on behind closed doors, and you need to keep that in mind. Don't assume that what you see externally on this side of a home is the true picture. Why do I say that? Because years ago I began to do a radio program. I didn't plan on it, I was asked to. Initially it was a 15 minute daily radio program. We took one theme a week. We were doing programs that were not heard on Christian radio. Childhood sexual abuse was one. And I was surprised because I was new in doing this and what I saw, the mail would triple or quadruple, triple or quadruple when it would be the topic of childhood sexual abuse or domestic violence. And what I heard over and over in these letters and from individuals, I've never told anyone this before. Those were words written. I'm remembering one time one of our team members uh, she was opening the mail. She got ashen. I wasn't even thinking about telling this, but I'm remembering it now. And she just slowly walked one pace after another. And she said, I've just read my story. And it's bringing back memories that have been buried. Someone was recounting for the first time about a grandfather. And this person didn't want to be going to now to the grandfather's house. And she's going, that happened to me. But when she, both of them, the person in the letter and the, our team member at Hope for the Heart, when, when she said, I, I don't want to go, I don't want to, of course you want to go, honey. Of course you want to go. That's your, you always love going to your grandparents, and they just totally discounted it, not having any idea to say, why, honey? Why don't you want to go? Talk with me. Has something happened to you? Is there something that was uncomfortable that you experienced? But so often we don't know to ask those questions. And yet there can be telltale signs along the way. What I remember distinctly was the statistics. Why am I telling you this story? Well, partly because when I called Georgia on the phone, I said, well, Georgia, what, what is it that you're wanting? I just knew it was sexuality. I said, but we have material on homosexuality, uh, sexual integrity, um, uh, we have uh, sexual addiction, we have, and, you know, we, we, you know, we have all the you know, abuse recovery, all these things. And I said, what is it that you're wanting? What kind of sexuality do you want me to address? And she said, someone at her church talked about being abused. I said, okay, could they 
do here address this topic? I said, I would love to do that. I really have a heart for that. You see, there are statistics that, were, that I've been using because those are police statistics. One in three girls, one in five boys up to the age of 18 are victims of childhood sexual abuse. First time I heard that, I thought, that's astonishing. The first statistic was one in four girls, one in seven boys, but we had a policeman part-time working at our ministry, Hope for the Heart. And he said, June, your statistics are not police statistics. You need to be current. I said, okay, what are they? One in three girls, one in five boys. Often I think of it this way. You think about a Sunday school class of girls. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You think about a conference like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I've already had numerous people come up to me telling me their story. Very touching, very painful. What they experienced. But I often think of this. Now is not forever. This is what one thing that we can share with someone who is in the throes of recovery. Now is not forever. Now is not forever. And the perpetrator's assumption is you won't tell the secret. It's the secret. I call it the secret storm. The secret. The assumption is, no, there are ways to keep this a secret. I think it can be very insightful for you if that's not even been a part of your life. You can have a sensitivity that most people won't have because most people don't know a lot about this unless they've experienced it personally. And even those who've experienced it personally don't know often what to do. They don't understand many times. And they, they'll just try to avoid it. They don't want to think about it. They, they'll try to push it away for the understandable reason. It's traumatizing. It's traumatizing. So, what is childhood sexual abuse? First of all, the word abuse means using something or someone in an inappropriate or wrong way. It's wrong. And abuse is not accidental. It's not like carrying a little child and you trip on the stairs and you fall and even if a child's arm is broken or something, that's not what we're talking about. It's not abuse. That's an accident. Abuse is intentional. So abuse results in emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical harm. And abuse is intentional. And by the way, the Bible does not shy away from acknowledging the reality of horrific abuse. In Judges, we see a horrible story. They raped her and abused her throughout the night, and at dawn, they let her go. It, it was a horrible situation. You know, I appreciate that the Bible doesn't sugarcoat life. There's a lot of painful reality that's described in the Bible, and it's a reflective, a reflection of life. Childhood sexual abuse is any physical visual or verbal interaction with a minor by someone older whose purpose is sexual stimulation or sexual satisfaction. Let me just see your hands. Um, how many of you were told 
as a child, obey your elders, or something close to that, obey your elders. May I see your hands? Okay. Was anybody not told that? Is there anybody here? There surely would be a few. No. Okay. An elder, obey your elders, can be someone a year older to a child. And what I know is I never was given any qualifications about obey when it is this, but don't obey when it's that. There were no qualifications. We're going to get to that because I want to empower you to help kids. I want to empower you to give power to children to say no. We'll do that later. In childhood sexual abuse, it's almost always committed by someone the child knows because the child has, is, is available and there's some vulnerability when you understand the three most common abusers are family members in this order, family members, family friends, babysitters. Familiarity sets the stage for a child to be all the more vulnerable to a victimizer because there's a sense of trust. Of course you're going to trust if it's your family. The assumption is there's a haven of refuge in the family. The Bible is not silent about deceitful schemes of victimizers. Psalm 10 verse 9 says, like a lion in cover, he lies in wait. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off into his net. That means that there is a challenge to conscientious family members to make sure kids are safe with the people entrusted to the children. In other words, if it is a babysitter, if it is a family friend, I never will forget somebody telling me, yep, my, my dad's best friend, that there was a swimming pool, and this man was teaching me how to swim. And he would hold me, but under the water, he was fondling me. But I couldn't tell dad it would break his heart. I wouldn't have hurt my dad. We must be vigilant. Marilyn described herself, Marilyn Vanderbur from Denver, described herself as lying stiff as a board, night after night. And the things she tried to do to be deterrence turning the temperature down as cold as it could be, um, doing, you know, even putting a sign, please go away, let me sleep, that she took off of a train. You know, she, she tried all these things. Of course, she didn't have the words to say to her dad, but she felt overpowered by her dad. Nothing she did could stop him. Like Job in the Bible, Marilyn found no safe haven from the terrors she experienced. Job 30, terrors overwhelm me. My dignity is driven away as by the wind. My safety vanishes like a cloud. Well, what exactly is incest as opposed to just childhood sexual abuse? I would just say, Incest is a subset. Of, it's um, one of the types of childhood sexual abuse. Incest is sexual interaction with a child or an adolescent by a person who's a member of the child's family. Listen to this. Blood relative, 
adoptive relative or related by marriage or remarriage. It usually continues a long time, not just a one-time act. Incest occurs in the following relationships. And by the way, I, I remember in the first or second year that our ministry was in existence as a radio program, the first two years we did interviews every other week. And, and a, someone who, who had experienced um, the depth of, of childhood sexual abuse, it was a rare book from a Christian on this particular topic. And I, I remember um, I was, you know, fairly new and doing all this and the interviewing, but, you know, I was talking with this wonderful guest who had written this book. And all of a sudden I froze. I said, even though this was being taped, I said, could I talk with you after this recording? And she said, of course. I said, I, I didn't know. I've never, I never understood what incest was now, I see. I thought incest meant father to daughter. I never heard it could be an uncle, a uh, grandfather, a cousin. And when she said cousin, that's when there was a delay in me talking. I didn't understand that. And all of a sudden, my mind escaped way back when I kept getting trapped. I didn't know what to do. I wouldn't have thought about telling my mom. I, I, it, I mean, I just, somehow, I kept getting trapped. And it was a cousin, and I didn't know what to do. Finally, I thought, just, I, th I was probably 11-ish, but what I can remember is I finally thought, try not to ever be in the room where he is. This was out of town and out of state where I was, we were visiting regularly relatives. And so all of a sudden, I thought, okay. And so finally, I realized he's come in the room. I'm going out of the room. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that Jesus said, the truth sets you free? I can't tell you how many times I found myself feeling powerless in life, other totally different situations. Not knowing what to do, but not talking. Now, I did come from a very bizarre background. My dad had three families going on at the same time. I grew up with a fictitious last name. We were the third family of his. Um, he had all these women. It, 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 it was horrible, and uh, finally, my parents did marry, and at some point, I started using my real name, June Hunt. I was earlier June Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. I was told that what my parents were doing was right, but it was wrong, even, you know, it, yeah. it, but, but you know, when you grow up in these strange things, strange situations, at times you just don't know what to do. And you don't have any, I didn't feel I had anybody to talk with for years. And I didn't share this until I was 400 years old. <laughs> you know, I, I felt there was always a cork in my throat. I couldn't get it out. 
And then one day I was asked to speak at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention. I thought, well, okay, I'll do that. Give my testimony. Okay, I'll do that. And then I'm sitting in my bed ready to jot down what I think I'll do the next morning before several thousand people. And it, and it was like there's voices, the real story, June. I thought, the real story? Now, I didn't, I, didn't, I, don't, I didn't tell that part that I'm telling you right now. I'm just, it was just the real story of the bizarreness of my upbringing. But I can tell you, there are things that impact us from childhood where we feel powerless. And we've got to figure out how to help others who are in the same situation. We've got to give permission to people, to kids, and those who have been abused to get it out. I can tell you, I am so much healthier today than I was when I wasn't speaking. And I know it's hard. And you're saying, well, but, and there are other relatives around. Yeah, I understand. That's what makes it so hard and sticky. But, what we need to understand is that God is for what's healthy. He's for truth. He wants to set the captives free. And if we are captive based on what others have done, he wants us to be set free. And he wants us to be set free from assuming we were guilty. Because the classic thing is you made me do it, or you wanted it, or there were all these reasons why kids later don't tell. Notice, though, in regard to incest, the Bible is very clear. God's heart is very clear. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. That's Leviticus 18, 6. So, God knows when there is injustice. And he cares about injustice. We need to understand that people who do unjust things will not get away with it. The scripture says, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. He knows how to pay back a person in the right way. Not with a type, of, he, in fact, he doesn't want us to take personal vengeance, but that doesn't mean we don't confront. Um, some people think, well, now what, what exactly is, is, is childhood sexual abuse? I'm just gonna give you a very quick list. There's indirect abuse, sexual abuse, and then there's direct. Indirect it would be voyeurism. A woman told me, she's a marvelous pianist, but she was terrified later. I could tell there was something unusual. She, she had this fear, and I was trying to figure out why. Her dad kept coming in when she was a child and as a teenager, and he would, she was, she'd be showering or she would be using the bathroom. And he would just stare at her. She said it was so uncomfortable, but she didn't have words to say, stop. Or and finally, there was a point at which she started locking the door, but then he would find a way to get in. You understand, this is not healthy. And she felt, in fact, she, she, she became such a people pleaser because she felt she had no control to do anything. There are reasons why people have unhealthy responses. And so often it's because of things that happened in the past. Exhibitionism, being exposed to inappropriate nudity by someone older. Lewdness, being made uh, to listen to sexual talk or watch sexual acts. Pornography, being shown pictures, magazines, photos, movies of sex acts, uh, child pornography. 
being made to pose for various videos, movies, photographs, sexually, uh, being made to masturbate in front of someone else who's observing. And uh, it, just that self-stimulation, there's psychological abuse, sexual name-calling, made to feel like a sex object. The direct sexual abuse would be fondling, um, I won't describe them all, intimate kissing, meaning being kissed in a sexual way, oral sex, penetration, rape, um, child prostitution, sadism. That means being subjected to painful use of objects on sexual parts. Satanic ritual abuse. Um, sadistic sexual abuse uh, in ceremonies. I've talked with a number of people who, in fact, I have a, two friends. This was part of their package in life early on. One of our team members, she was made to pick the instrument that would be used on her by her father. He would have a number of things and she had to pick what he would use on her sexually. And then the brothers found out what was going on and then they started doing the same thing. As a result, she chose to, uh, she de was determined to gain excessive weight. She would wear overalls and she wanted to look anything but feminine. She got involved in a lesbian relationship. She hated being feminine. She was just 5'2". She was fabulous. When she came to Christ, it was just, you talk about an unleashing. Then she started something at her church, just the pastor let her say, you know, inv uh, need healing from sexual abuse. All of a sudden, in her apartment, here are all these people from the church coming that she didn't know. And so she wrote some of the material and we would talk about it. I mean, it, it was fascinating because she had such a heart for people coming to Christ because she knew she had been set free. But the things that were done to her were horrible. And, you know, we have to realize Proverbs 10 says, when the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone but the righteous stand firm forever. When I think about Renee, oh, <laughs> what a change. And then how she turned around to help others that she knew would be in a church. She didn't know who they were. Well, when given an opportunity, they would get together and they came up with steps for healing. Because at that time, there just wasn't anything out there on a Christian, from a Christian basis. Now, I mentioned Marilyn Vanderver. I take her story actually all the way through our Biblical Counseling Keys on Childhood Sexual Abuse because it's just parallel in all these areas. We, we do a section on who are the um, passive parents or the, let me say it differently, it's like they're called non-offending parents, but you know, you have to think about this. Where was, where was Marilyn's mother? She was all caught up in this fantasy that she had a perfect home. I mean, from the outside, looked perfect. Attractive, wealthy, accomplished herself, the mother. Well, let me share. There are passive parents. There are preoccupied parents and prideful parents. What I'm saying is typically the non-protective parents can be divided into several groups. The passive parents, they give silent consent to sexual abuse. They're not the perpetrators, but it's, it'd be like the mom just by ignoring the abuse. 
they usually feel powerless themselves to protect them themselves, much less their own children. And they ultimately victimize their children by withholding both physical protection and emotional support. The second would be a preoccupied parent. They don't know about the abuse because they're so busy living this lifestyle, they're all too consumed, they're not paying attention to their own hurting child. Um, they put their time and energy into solving their own emotional problems or satisfying their own unmet needs. And of course the prideful parents, they put a high value on outward appearances. If anything looks like it could be threatening that image, uh, mm -mm. Uh, there's this ideal. That's where Marilyn's mother was. Refusing to believe that sexual abuse could even exist within their picture-perfect home or if it's there, it's, I will not acknowledge it. They will not take their child's word that such a travesty as sexual abuse has occurred. Now listen to this scripture. Proverbs 18.5 It is not good to be partial to the wicked and so deprive the innocent of justice. Now there is one other kind and that is a protective parent who initially may not see signs of abuse because the perpetrator can be very skilled at hiding sexual abuse contact. Later though, when they learn, they do confront, they do take action, and they do protect if they're made aware of the abuse, no matter who the abuser might be. These protective parents diligently pray for wisdom because Jesus said, wisdom is proved right by all her children. Luke 7.35 I do want to mention something that is common. I feel so guilty. This is a person who's been perpetrated. I feel so guilty for the sexual acts with my father over the years. Why didn't I stop it? Why didn't I stop it? Um, victims of sexual abuse typically are plagued with feelings of guilt. Most feel guilty, almost all. But they didn't cause the abuse. This is false guilt. And I'm going to say this very intentionally to those of you who've struggled in this area. You do not have the power to make anyone sin against you. I'm going to repeat that. You do not have the power to make anyone sin against you. You can't cause somebody to commit childhood sexual abuse. You don't have that power. The fault is solely on the perpetrator. When someone's sin spills acid on you, you cannot escape the impact you can feel contaminated, but this is not your fault. It is not your blame. It is blameworthy only for the perpetrator. And in regard to Marilyn's mother, Marilyn she began to realize her mom knew about this. She could hear the click of her dressy heels one time and, and <laughs> here she is six feet away and her dad's in bed with her and she just turns and leaves. She said these words, there was never any doubt in my mind after that night that she knew. She walked away from me back into her perfect world, a world in which she was admired, respected, and charming. 
I knew she would never come back. And for the hundreds and hundreds of nights to come, she never did. Children like Marilyn cannot change their parents. However, they can change their powerless responses in adulthood by choosing not to stay powerless. I will just say, if you were abused as a child, my heart is with you. And God understands that, but I want you to know you can move from victim to victor, uh, from sufferer to survivor, from an emotional cripple to an overcomer. And, you know, the Lord himself said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You can become an overcomer. It takes time, but oh my goodness, the difference that those who understand this personally in their testimony, the difference they can make in the lives of others. Let me give you the typical course of childhood sexual abuse. There are four S's that we have put together. Seduction, stimulation, silence, and suppression. Seduction is when the perpetrator emotionally entices and leads the child astray. Specifically, how? By developing intimacy and a warped sense of loyalty through granting special privileges, building trust progressively with ulterior motives. The child is thinking, oh, how thoughtful. This, I'm thinking about right now, a counselor that I send people to, by the way. She's my favorite person who, to, to be a go-to counselor when there has been childhood sexual abuse because she was the favored niece. And much, much later, this special feeling that she had, being the attentive special friend, our special relationship, doing all these things, it could be gifts, bribes. In adulthood, all of a sudden, she had memories, a slew of memories that she had not had during childhood. These were not false memories. Indeed. But it's during this seduction stage, it's, it's showing preferential treatment, playing games, giving money or gifts or bribes or rewards. Then stimulation. This is when the perpetrator moves from the back rubs to more intrusive sexual areas. It would be normally tender touching, but then it moves to gradually seek to desensitize the child to a progression of increased inappropriate touch and, and sexual contact. So the perpetrator is physically preparing the child for sexual activity. Then silencing. The perpetrator methodically moves to ensure the, sil the silence of the child. How? If you tell our secret, and here are threats, I will tell them you wanted this. You were the one. I will, and then sometimes it's threatening to kill a pet, to kill a person. And countering the child's feeling of rage at the reality of being in this relationship and the rage of possibly lose, losing the relationship because there was this specialness. What, it, it's so confusing. There becomes a bit of a, well, it, it's a love-hate. I hate what's going on, but I love this person because they're, 
being thoughtful toward me. And, 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 the, and the experience feels good. This is one of the hardest things. What do you do if you, you say, wait a minute, this was abuse, but I felt some, some pleasure in this. All it is is God created certain parts of our bodies to respond with pleasure in the areas of sexual stimulation. And all of that is preparatory for marriage. It's not about you. It's just that's your body. All of our bodies are created that way. This is nothing unusual. It's just the problem is it's the perpetrator who did something at the wrong time. This wasn't marriage. This is childhood sexual abuse. So you've got to let go or help others to get go of false guilt again. Then there is, as, as I said, suppression. Let, let me just mention this, suppression. Um, the, the intent is to ensure that nobody's going to rescue. And what that means is, let's say the perpetrator subdues the child by ensuring no one's going to come because they're not going to believe you. So the child feels doubly betrayed, especially if the child reports it. Oh, don't be silly. Oh, don't, don't talk that way. He would never do such a thing. Do not dismiss something that is so abnormal for a child to talk about. You must investigate it. Even if you think, how could that be? Well, just look at the statistics. The issue, though, is you need to do your part, we need to do our part to help children. By the way, for those who experience this, this type of abuse, the, I'm going to mention three stages. They are victims that can become survivors. Victims can continue to feel like victims into adulthood, living with a victim mentality. In other words, once a victim, always a victim. Still always feeling powerless. Survivors, now I know that this is the term that's usually used. Well, I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. The only problem is I, I have this image of um, like a movie star being washed on this island with a, was it a basketball? Or volleyball, anyway, and he's barely surviving, and he just, but just barely, you know. Well, yeah, okay, it, surviving is better than not, but realize the need here for facing the past in order to heal from the past. At times we have to faith, face the past in order to heal from the past, but I like the word conqueror. We're told we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That means a conqueror is not living in the past, not being controlled by the past, but has a knowledge from the past to be used by God to possibly help others. They live victoriously over the past and are no, no longer in bondage to the painful memories. That's why Romans 8:37 is important. And all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Now, I'm going to mention just uh, some emotional signs. These are characteristics. Like, well, okay, a fear of authority figures. If all of a sudden there's a change, fear of authority figures, uh, avoiding intimacy, Fear of going to bed. I don't want to go to bed. And there's, but it's not just kids not wanting to go to bed. If you are sensing something that's a change in demeanor, um, bedwetting, when there's not been bedwetting for a long time. Um, in other words, there are habit disorders like all of a sudden sucking the thumb, rocking like a, 
it's like being wanting to go back to childhood. I mean, I mean, early, early, like a baby wanting nurturing. What is this about? Or obsessive washing, obsessive cleaning. That's not uncommon. I remember one person, it was this, we had a team member and her daughter started drawing sexual parts of male anatomy. And she thought, what is this? And the mom had just gone through this divorce and, she, and, and then she started doing things, trying to do things to her mother, like French kissing the mom. And she's going, what, wait a minute, where is this coming from? And so it needed to be reported. So that when you're seeing changes, um, I got a call this week, a six-year-old. I have a friend who didn't know what to do. Somebody had come to her. The six-year-old was doing something with a two-year-old boy, the six-year-old boy to the two-year-old boy. Well, and and the, this little boy, he, he didn't know anything was wrong. Where did he learn to do that? There was a 12-year-old boy. Now that boy had been caught two years before and the dad said, absolutely tell nobody. So all of that was stuffed. So if, there, so if there's anything that's inappropriate, it has to be looked at and strongly considered. Um, in regard to why do perpetrators abuse children? I'm just going to give you three reasons. We have a lot more information on this, but I just want you to understand, they have a desperate need to control someone. Their solution for their lives, this is why do perpetrators abuse children? This is really a profile of predators. Um, they have a desperate need to control, and they see their sexual actions as a solution to their problems. This is a solution. They use sex to feel loved. They have difficulty forming healthy adult relationships, so they use children. Proverbs 16, 2 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Why are certain victims chosen? Well, first, They've got to be vulnerable, so the profile of victims of somehow they're vulnerable. Um, they appear open or defenseless, helpless. Uh, they are insecure. They're compliant, trusting. Children are typically trusting. They're intimidated. They're easily manipulated and suppressed. I'm going to go on because I'm, this is a big question that people ask. Why don't children tell? Look, this is bad. Why don't they just tell? And that's an understandable question. It's because they feel shame or false guilt. They're assuming it's their fault somehow. They're very confused. They feel obligated to the abuser out of love and loyalty because, see, they're getting special treatment. We're not talking about rape. It's rare that it's rape. It's usually a continual action. And it feels special at the time, initially. They, and they can fear the one that they tell won't believe them. Some can't tell because they have, it's called dissociation, dissociative identity disorder. Marilyn Vanderper, let me tell you about her. She was a day child and a night child. The day child had no knowledge of the night child. This is why this, from five years to 18, she could accomplish all these things. She could be a straight-A student. She could be the swim champ, all these things. She had no knowledge of the night child. There was, listen to this, at age 
seven, up to age, age seven, age seven, the mind can, I'm gonna use the term, not, well, it's dissociate, but can split off, sometimes it's called splitting, and there's a part of the brain that carries that pain. So that that child doesn't have a mental breakdown, an emotional breakdown, I at times have thought that's a, that can be a gift from God. Now what can happen, and somebody here described to me what happened to her in her 30s. All of a sudden, when her daughter became the age at which she was abused, all of a sudden she had these emotions. She just, something was wrong, something was wrong. And she calls her mom and, um, was I abused? Was I specifically sexually abused? Her mother was one of the abusers. All kinds of things. And there, was, there were other family members. And, and I think this woman is so, so, so brave to tell me about this. And I think she's getting healthier and healthier and healthier in, in the choices she has made. It's amazing. But she didn't, she, do you understand, dissociation. Uh, have you ever driven a car and all of a sudden you're where you don't remember actually making that turn and all because you just, you just kind of do it. That's a form of dissociation. It's not unhealthy at all. But a disorder, dissociative identity disorder, that means it impairs normal functioning. Marilyn Vanderburg, she, all of a sudden, when her daughter becomes this age, the flashback started coming about her abuse. So, just to let you know that sometimes children don't tell because, like with Marilyn, she wasn't aware during the daytime at all. Only when she went to bed at night and she didn't, want, she didn't like going to bed. They fear the abuser's authority. They feel threatened by the abuser. Oh, and, and it's kind of using the guilt game. If you share our secret, it'll break my heart. If you share our secret, mother's feelings will be hurt. You, mom won't understand and she'll leave us. Your mom will divorce me. Uh, our family will be destroyed. All these things that can be said to a child. Or if you share our, share our secret, I won't love you anymore. Or I'll kill you, or I'll kill myself. All these different, lang the, this language. Why should a victim tell to protect other children from being abused by that perpetrator? To break the power of the secret, the secret that holds the victim captive. You tell because you can now stop from having to live a lie and covering up the truth. You tell because it'll enable people to be set free from false guilt. It'll encourage others who are victims to tell. I still love how Jesus said the truth sets you free in all facets of our lives. There's a wrong belief. I can't stop. I can't stop what's going on, I can't tell anyone, I've got to keep it a secret, I'm so bad, it's my fault, I feel so dirty, I can never be clean again. Right belief for the abused. What's happening to me is bad, but I'm not bad. The, this abuse is not my fault. Telling the truth to somebody I can trust is good in order to stop the bad so it won't happen again. Jesus loves all children and he loves me and I'm trusting him to make me clean and to take care of me. To have somebody to help children with these kinds of words, it is unbelievably freeing. 
realize there are a lot of adults who are victims. Victims are people who are powerless <sighs> over being oppressed or tricked or duped or harassed, hurt, harmed. Victims are powerless. Think of the word victimization. Think of power, the word powerless. What is a victim mentality in, in what is the victim mentality in adulthood? It's a mindset where a person who was once a victim continues on with that old thought pattern that fosters feelings of powerlessness even after the victimization has ended. This is classic and we've got to change this. You can't help unless you were trained, you can't help what happened to you when you were a child by perpetrators. But that was then, this is now. The victim mentality causes, uh, causes people to see others as powerful, but themselves as powerless. Isn't it interesting how the Word of God tells us the power that we have we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So we've got to learn how to literally apply truth to set us free. That truth from 2 Corinthians 10, 5 is huge. So for an adult victim, the wrong belief would be, I'm powerless. I was powerless to change my life growing up. That may be true. And I'm powerless to change it now. That's not true. What's happened to me has defined me. That's not true. And I don't deserve anything better. I'm just not as good as others. And I just don't want to be discovered as the failure that I am. Nope. The right belief is, as a child of God, when you humble your heart and you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, as a child of God, I have Christ living in me. His, this is important, He gives us Himself, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So He gives you power to change. It's His power on the inside. I give Him my fear of failure and I accept responsibility to overcome my past because God is faithful. He will do it. That's what the scripture says. Faithful is He who calls you and He will do it. I can take my thought, every thought, captive to begin a process of renewing my mind. And I'm going to choose to do that. So what's wonderful is we are told his divine power has given us everything we need to live a godly life. Now, initially, adult victims, they struggle with low self-worth, even to the point of accepting abuse, accepting blame, accepting condemnation. They can have a dependency on, well, their personal abilities. It can be drugs, alcohol, a people dependency. That would be codependency. They're fearful of, of, of abandonment, affection, authority figures. They're excessive in control, seriousness in work. By the way, they make the best workers. Why? Those who felt powerless and bad things happened. In adulthood, uh-uh, I'm not going to be powerless. I'm going to be the best that I can be. Typically, they are phenomenal workers. They are very, very dedicated. And they are serious. They're serious about doing the best job possible. But it can get to excess because they have to be in control and they're, they're not wanting to do it wrong, they just don't know what to do. They can feel compulsive, compulsiveness about perfectionism. I have to do it perfectly or, or it's not, I'm not valuable. Uh, compulsiveness about responsibility, they become over responsible at times and they can have certain rituals that they must do because they've got to be in control. 
Now, let me tell you one thing that's great about those who have been victims. They know that if they could have just done things differently, they would have done it. So I'm going to give you something that you're going to use. Some of you are parents. Those of you who are not, a lot of you are aunts and uncles and grandparents. So I'm going to give you how to give children permission to say no. How to give children permission to say no. We put this in the back of, the, it's, it's on the outline that you have at the back so that you don't have to, don't try to take the notes. You've got it all, I hope, I think they're all, it's all written down there. The, the bottom line is this. Many children do not know they have permission to take action to protect themselves against somebody who's older because nobody has said that they need to protect themselves. They don't realize what's happening initially and they become too frightened to react quickly since most children are taught to obey authority figures, they need to be empowered to protect themselves from anyone who would hurt them. I love doing this. I had somebody in my studio the other day. She's a grandmother, and she said, by the way, I use this with my grandchildren, and I'm doing it a second time tomorrow night. I said, really? She said, because she herself had been sexually abused. She said, I just love this. So. These statements will instill confidence and help young hearts resist inappropriate sexual advances. In other words, we need to qualify. If you say, obey your elders, don't make it just blanket like that. You've got to have as long as they do not do whatever. Okay. This is how I suggest you do it. God loves you and made your body with a special plan and purpose. If you're asked to do something you think is wrong, say no, even to an older relative or friend of the family. Your body belongs to you, and you decide who touches it. The parts of your body covered by your bathing suit, that's the key word, the key two words, bathing suit. Everybody say, bathing suit. One, two, three, bathing suit. Anybody can say this because most parents go, I can't talk about this. I don't I mean, No, you can talk about a bathing suit. The parts of your body, body covered by your bathing suit are private. Let's just say that together. The parts of your body covered by your bathing suit are private. Do not touch the private parts of someone else and never allow anyone to touch your private parts unless it's for medical reasons and a safe person. It could be parents, could, you know, but it's got to be a safe person is present. You see? It could be for medical reasons. If someone tries to touch your private parts, scream, stop, and then run to a safe place. If someone touches your private parts and says it's okay, they're wrong. You must tell me or someone you trust. If others tell you to touch their private parts, say no, then tell me. If someone doesn't stop touching you, say, I'll tell if you don't stop. Then when you're safe, tell me or a responsible adult. If someone threatens you, don't be afraid, tell anyway. If someone tells you to keep the touching a secret, tell anyway. If the adult you tell doesn't believe you, keep telling no matter how mm, awkward you feel. Keep telling until somebody believes you. And then, identify a safe adult you can trust to help you. Someone who is not a member of your family. This verse in the Bible is vital to share with every child. If sinful men entice you, it could be earth. The sinful person entices you, do not give in to them. Proverbs 1.10. So what do you do? Let me just say, by the way, I've done this with, as a youth director, 
and I've helped youth directors do this, where they do it and they make it fun. I said, all right, I'm going to give you something you're going to scream about. Everybody scream. Ah! Okay, and they love that. Scream again. Ah! Okay, now I'm going to give you something to scream about. If somebody is going to do something bad to you, you're going to be able to scream. And so then you start going, oh, great, you know, and, and you go through it, and then all of a sudden, I say, now, now is your time to scream, and they'll do it, and they're laughing. They're, it's fun with them, but now they're actually doing it. Do you understand? Because you're giving them permission to scream, and, and some, one youth director, he said, well, I, I'm, I'm just having the kids run around when that happens, because he knew that there was abuse going on in the area, <coughs> excuse me, where, um, excuse me, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> well, yes, I, sh I shouldn't scream, should I? <coughs> sorry. Um, <coughs> when you have the pain of abuse, and you've been, a, been felt powerless. I'm going to cover a few points. You face your prison. You face your prison. Th think of it as a number of things you're going to have to face in order to be set free. You're going to find freedom from bondage. Do I feel there's no way out of my situation? Um, do I? feel powerless in relationships? Do I lie in other to avoid conflict? Uh, do I have difficulty saying no? By the way, I tell people, at times you need to say no to people so that you can say yes to God. You have to say no to people so you can say yes to God. You face your past. Sometimes God brings up the past through parenthood, flashbacks, media coverage. Um, sometimes it's overcoming an addiction and all of a sudden reality sets in. Or it could be the significant death of the perpetrator. Physical touch will be a key thing to remember, meaning to enable you to remember and get reality in your life. You face uh, your patterns of behavior. Sometimes we do things like compromise our values. In other words, we all have three inner needs for love, significance, and security. Love, significance, and security. And there are times when we can be compromising our values in order to feel loved. Trying to get a need met illegitimately. It's a legitimate need, but we're trying to get it met illegitimately. Um, violating your conscience in order to feel secure. Or, for example, being per uh, perfectionistic or a fixer or a workaholic in order to feel significant. Look at the negative behaviors. Why is anything to excess? Realize no temptation has taken you but what is common to us all. But God is faithful who will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll provide a way out so that you can endure it. 1 Corinthians 10:13. You face the private secret. Talking about it actually helps get that, pre get that pressure out in, and it empowers you to literally break the power of the secret. Telling brings um, what was done in the dark into the light for healing. And we're told to confess sins to one another, pray for each other so that you may be healed. You face your pain. Pain, by the way, confirms your abuse. Uh, pain re that's, I'm going to say it this way, pain unrevealed is pain unhealed. Pain unrevealed is pain unhealed. We can turn it around. Pain expressed is pain released. Pain expressed is pain released. And this is why we need to face the pain. Um, you face the perpetrator if it is safe. You face the perpetrator when it's safe. That actually empowers you. You pray for the right timing, pray for preparation in your heart. 
So specifically, uh, pray for the heart of the victimizer to accept responsibility, even though that is usually not the case. Most will deny any, any wrongdoing. So be prepared for the offender to deny uh, having abused you. But the Bible says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you, and if he doesn't listen, two or three others are to come too. When do you confront? When it is safe for you, and when you can confront positively and in strength. And you would say, I want you to know, I remember the abusive things you did to me. There was a singer a, who was singing for Christian conferences and meetings. She called her brother and said, I'd like to talk with you. They lived in two different states. She flew in and she said, I just want you to know, I remember what you did when I was a girl. I remember the sexual things you did. And I want you to know also that I have humbled my heart and received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So I have chosen to forgive you. My prayer is that one day you would literally have a changed life through Christ. That is what I think would be the greatest act in your entire life if ever you would do that. In this case, the, this man was so stunned at her confrontation, all of a sudden he recognized the depravity of his life and what he had done. Three weeks later, he prayed to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior, and after a period of time, he became an elder in their church, and he truly became a godly man but he had to give his life to Christ, and it was a total changed life. Most people will deny it, though, but for you to do this, you know you've done what the Bible says, and that is to confront. In terms of facing the pardon, um, you don't need to be carrying the weight of all that wrong. <clears throat> How do you forgive? Many people say, I cannot, I cannot do this. Um, yes, you can if you realize you're not letting a person off the hook. What you're doing is taking that person off of your hook, putting that person onto God's hook because he says, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. So you release the pain from you literally to... You, know, you weren't created by God to carry those boulders of bitterness, the rocks of resentment. You were not created to carry stones of hostility that weigh you down. So you take that offender off of your hook and put the offender onto God's hook. It is mine to avenge. He says, I will repay. And you can be set free. We can help you if you need help with that. Uh, last thing I want to mention is <laughs> face the predicament. Yes. God did permit this. God did not create a protective bubble that we can live in. He's created everybody with will. People can choose to go against our will. People can go against God's will. But he knows how to give people a special care, a special connection with him. And what I have realized is that he can stretch the capacity of our compassion. He stretches the capacity of our compassion. When we have been wronged, we can then understand the pain of others who have been wronged. I just want to share this. This song meant so much to me the first time I ever heard these words. Loving arms, if you'd never shed a tear, would you welcome going home if you'd never been away? Would you cherish gentle words if 
if you'd never been afraid I don't think so I don't think so I really don't think so Would you value having hope if you'd never known despair Would you cherish being safe if you'd never lost your way you cherish guiding hands if you'd never been alone I don't think so I don't think so I really don't think so what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to to carry everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. If we knew the love that the Lord had shown to us, if we really tried to do what the Lord had planned for us, then we'd love each other more. We would find new happiness. Yes, I think so. Yes, I think so. I really do think so. Yes, we'd love each other more. We would find new I think so. Yes, I think so. I really do think so. Let me say, that is Marilyn Vanderburgh's mission today. It's helping those who have been abused. There are times when God will use you to share privately with someone. If it puts it on your heart, he puts it on your heart to share. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this. Something I learned, and I didn't expect this. As I've been on radio for years uh, on occasion when I find out someone has had severe abuse or just sexual abuse I will say has it been difficult for you to trust God Have, has it honestly been difficult to entrust your life to God and they will have already said some spiritual things that are good but the, the answer is yes. I said, may I suggest why? It could be because children, and this is important, when children hear the word God, what do they think? They are concrete thinkers. What are they going to think of? Probably and usually it is the father in the home. It'll be the most powerful person. Well, if that father or someone in the, who's really important is a perpetrator they put onto God the characteristics of the earthly father do you understand onto 
the Heavenly Father. And at that point, I need to say, I, is it possible that you don't trust God because you're thinking and you're feeling, I can't. I can't because, because, and sometimes I'll say, well, what do you think God is like? And then I'll hear a distortion. Let me tell you what God's like. And I'll mention three things. Did you know for those three inner needs of love, significance, and security, those three needs, he says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. And everlasting means forever, not here today, gone tomorrow. That's for love, Jeremiah 31, 3. And he says, you're so significant, I've got a plan for you. I know the plans I have for you. Not to harm you, but to give you hope in the future, Jeremiah 29, 11. This is huge. So he, um, he loves you with an everlasting love, and his love is pure. His love is always does what's best in behalf of another person. That's agape love. He does what's best for you, and then he has a plan and purpose for you, and when you come into a changed life, you have a real true relationship with him, you're entrusting your life to him, then he says, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. In fact, my favorite scripture is uh, Deuteronomy 31.8. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Now think about that. For those who can't trust God, all of a sudden, it's like saying, wait a minute, this is the God of the Bible. Not an image of what once was in a home or in an abusive relationship. Do you see? So I just thought, well, is it possible that someone needs to be set free? And maybe there's a block. I've seen it over and over and over. Let's just bow our heads. I want you to think about, have you had difficulty trusting God with your life? You can believe in Jesus gentle shepherd Jesus but we're talking about trusting him with all your heart leaning not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledging him because he will direct your path so the question is is it that this true salvation experience is something you need because you know you're not set free if that is the case you can tell him now because God does have divine appointments with people. If that is your need, and you're willing to let him meet that need for true, literal salvation, just pray with me. God, I need a real relationship with you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for not giving up on me. Right now, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to be my personal Lord and Savior. I give you control of my life. I'm willing to trust you with my life. Change me inside out and make me the person you created me. I give you my mind and my will. I give you my heart and my life. I give you all of me. Make me the person you created me to be. In your holy name, I pray. Keeping your heads bowed, those of you who were willing to truly yield your will to the will of the Lord Jesus, who prayed that prayer with me, would you look at me right now? I'm going to be looking over here to my left and your right. You prayed that prayer. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the family of God. 
Welcome to the family of God. You realize when you do this, you're entering into his family. Yes, I see. Okay, welcome to the family of God. This is very precious. Welcome to the family of God. Yes. Yes, welcome to the family of God. You're entering. He adopts you into his family, and he's a perfect father. Okay. Yes? Okay, yes. Welcome to the family of God. This is life-changing for those of you who are willing to give him control of your life. I'm on the other side of the room now. Yes. Yes? Okay. Welcome to the family of God. I love that big smile. This is thrilling. Yes, I see you. Thank you. Welcome to the family of God, honey. Lord, you know every heart that truly prayed that prayer. How we thank you for what you're going to do in and to and through each person. Just healing any hurts. Literally empowering each person to be what you created them to be. Thank you for those who were willing to be trusting of you that you will meet your promises and I thank you for the unconditional love and the the plans that you have and the fact that you will not leave anyone who is yielded to you thank you Lord Jesus for your saving work and what the reason is why you've saved each person who prayed that prayer. Pour your wisdom into them and thank you for so great a salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for your delightful, intense learning in terms of the way that now you're going to be able to help others and I pray you'll be used mightily in the lives of others. Thank you, and God bless you. Well, thank you, June. That was just very, very powerful and a great way uh, to end our evening here. So, ladies, let's be back here at 9 a.m. All right, get, your, get a good night's sleep, get your coffees in the morning, and be prepared for another day of encouragement and equipping. And I'll just say a quick prayer and then you're out of here. Lord, I thank you for this day. Just thank you for the time that we've had together. I pray that you'll bless our travels, bless our sleep tonight, and help us to be ready and prepared for tomorrow. In your name I pray, amen. See you tomorrow, ladies. <laughs>